Take your Bible. Turn to Ecclesiastes 1 and Genesis 1. Um, Melissa said it. Um, that even though, and I want, I want everybody who's here, I want everybody who's online to listen to me. Uh, if you, if you are, uh, what, I, what we would say is young in the Lord. Um, and you may not, you may not know everything that the Bible says about salvation, and Christian life, Christian living, Christian growth. Um, that's what the church is for is to provide that teaching, that training, um, to, uh, that's what, why God calls pastors, men to be shepherds of the people is to feed the flock of God. That's one of the commandments that we're given to, uh, that applies directly to us ministers is to feed the flock of God. And as a under shepherd of the great shepherd to not only feed the flock, but protect the flock. And not only feed and protect the flock, but guide the flock, uh, sometimes in a rough manner. But that's why David said, when he was talking about the good shepherd Jesus, the Lord is my shepherd. He said, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Well, the shepherd's rod and the shepherd's staff are there to use against the sheep when they get out of line. And all we, like sheep, have gone astray. Amen? And God has provided a way for us, I preached that last Sunday, a way for us that when we go astray, and if God has to, He will use a rod of correction. Uh, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from Him. That's how God will raise us up as children of God. And as Melissa said, you will have highs, you will have lows, you will have good days, you will have bad days. Do not let anybody online or anybody on that stupid TBN TV network tell you that you can attain a high, a high level of leaving and have no problems after that. That you'll never have any down days, you'll never have any dark days. Uh, you'll, you'll never, you'll never be uh, sick. You'll never uh, have any diseases in your body. Don't, you'll always have money coming in. Don't let anybody talk you into that. That's a trap. It is a trap. You say, how is that a trap? It gets you to believing that if you don't have these things, you're not really saved. But the truth of it is, God maintains us the same way he maintains this world. You see it up there on the screen. In cycles, e Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse four, one generation passeth away and another generation cometh. That is the cycle. The reason why uh, this church took me and my sister to camp and Lisa to camp when we were young is so that we could be saved. We could learn Christian conduct, Christian living. We could learn how to pray with others. We could, uh, we could learn how to share the gospel with others so that we would grow up. We were trained. We were taught uh, the things of God through the Bible so that we would be the next generation to take over the maintenance of the church. Since I've been here as pastor, I've buried several of the people that I was in church under when I was a boy here. And all of those people are now gone. They're no longer around. And so it's my generation that is taking the reins and doing the work. But we're trying to teach this, that, that whole pew back there. That whole section over there. That section back there. That section here. We're trying to teach these children the ways of God. So that when they grow up, if the Lord tarries his coming, they will be, one of these will be the, maybe the one who's standing here in this pulpit. Wouldn't that be great if God raised up another one of these children in this church to end up being God's man behind this pulpit? That they would love the church the way I and Lisa love this church, the way our family loves this church. And so I just want to encourage everybody out there, when you have down days, when you have dark days... Listen, that's part of it. It really is part of it. And that's what we're trying to learn as we go through this. One generation passeth away and another generation cometh. Uh, but the earth abideth forever. 
The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he rose. That's another cycle. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. That's the third one. Now the fourth one. All the, and it just amazes me that this is in fours. Because of what the number four means. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. This is the gospel. You're looking at it right here. This is Christian growth, Christian life, Christian living. This is how it's going to be. All the rivers run into the sea. Yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. And uh, we need some of them. We need some more of that Gulf of Mexico moisture to come up around and get our gardens right. Amen. It's been dry now for a while. Hadn't stormed and rained on us for about a week. So we need some more water in the ground. But you're looking at your life and how it goes in cycles. And I have, a, I have a whole message on just the water cycle as it pertains to Christian growth. If you go on YouTube or go on Sermon Audio, you type this in, the cycles of Christian growth, and you'll see the entire uh, message that I preach about how the water cycle shows us, you know how the rivers run down into the ocean and the water goes all the way down into the depths? That's when you're, that's when you're feeling low. That's when you're in the pit. That's when uh, sin has taken uh, its toll on your life and you're way down in the deeps and you, down there you cry unto the Lord. Well, what happens? God picks up the water out of the ocean just and he uses the sun and the spirit to do it. The wind and the sun is what picks up the water out of the ocean and puts it up where? In the clouds. That's where I want to be this morning. I think I'm there this morning. I think I'm in the clouds. Amen. You can say, yeah, you sound kind of cloudy. A little dim. I want to be, I'm in the clouds this morning. I'm just walking on cloud night. Because you know my granddaughter got saved this week. Amen. And we saw some good things at camp. Amen. And what happens is, when I'm up in the clouds like this, I'm lofty. You don't know what that means? I'm too high for anybody's good. You know what I'm going to end up doing? Blocking the sun out of somebody's life. You think about that for a while. The sun is Jesus Christ. It's the light of the gospel. And it's us church people who are up here too long and we're no good to anybody. You know what we are? We're exactly what uh, Peter said of the false teachers. We're clouds without water. We're just up there blocking the sun from everybody else so that nobody else gets any growth in their life. So you know what God has to do? God has to bring us down. And you know how he does it? How does the water in the clouds come down to the earth? Rain. And the Bible says that my tears fell as rain. That's God bringing us down to the level that other people are on. And you know what the rain does? It waters the seed that's been planted so that others can grow thereby. Now God can use us because he's brought us back down low again. Just like Jesus came down from heaven, down to the earth. He could not have died for our sins up in heaven. He could not have shown us what he's shown us from heaven. He had to come down from heaven to do it. And that's you and I, a lot of times we get too proud. We get so full of ourselves. We stop praying. We stop reading our Bible. We stop giving attendance to the things that we used to give attendance to daily. And God says, I can't use you. I got to bring you back down. And he brings us back down again. And now we're a blessing. We're a flowing river. We're the rivers of water that waters all the trees and the fields and waters all the grass. But then what happens after that is we get down too low. And there we are again at the bottom. And what's God going to do? He's going to bring us right back up again. It happens all the time. And I will say this to you. I wish that somebody would have taught me this years and years and years ago. Because I just, so many times, I felt like quitting. Because I said, I'm not good enough. I can't 
do this. I'm not a good person. God, you picked the wrong man. But then God showed me one day how this works. Then he started showing it to me in the scriptures. And now that you know it, you'll see it in a lot of places. Let me, let me remind you of this tree here. This tree, I didn't preach this last Sunday, so I'm going to give you a little re memory, memory check here. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. The fact that it's a season shows you the cycles of how God grows us as born-again believers. Now, say, let me read these verses to you real quick. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new what? You know that word creature? It doesn't mean monster. It doesn't mean beast. It doesn't mean animal. It means a created being. You did not, listen, you did not evolve. You were created by God for a purpose. Amen. You are a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That happens at every cycle. It's like in, in the book of Lamentations where God said his mercies are new every morning. Everything you did yesterday is already gone. It's in the past. You've called out to God for forgiveness. God granted you the forgiveness. You woke up this morning. God said it's a brand new day. I'm going to start all over again with you. That's another cycle. It happens daily. It happens weekly. It happens monthly. You may, you may feel lifted up and great during a Sunday morning service and walk out of here thinking, boy, the devil cannot get me this week. I'm going to walk all over him. And by Thursday afternoon, you're going, oh, God, have mercy on me. I need to get to church. Galatians 6, 15, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new what? Creature. Psalm 19, verse 2. Watch this now. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. You know what he's th telling you? Cycles. Day unto day and night unto night. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So that is how we're going back now to Genesis chapter 1. Now I covered this. Uh, a couple Sundays ago, uh, in the very first day of creation. So I'm just going to run through it real fast. In fact, let's, uh, man, it's already 12 o'clock. Father, we ask your blessings on your word this morning. In Jesus' name, God, help us, Lord, to give our attention and our minds and our hearts to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in day one of creation, now this is God. This is you the day before you got saved. The day, we'll call it the day before you got saved. Your life was empty. It was void. It had no form. It had no beauty to it. It was, you were just a, a lump, a rock, a piece of coal. You were just fluff without any substance. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So what God's going to do is he's going to start the process of saving your life. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Gary, when you were in those drugs, that's darkness. That is darkness. Drugs dull the mind. They take the mind and they put it out somewhere else where you can't think straight. You can't talk straight. You can't walk straight. You can't act straight. There's not, there is no light in your life at all. Those days are dark days. If you remember the day before you got saved, you were in darkness, my friend. And had it not been for the Spirit of God moving on your life, you would still be there. Somebody say amen. And God said, watch this now, four words. Let there be light. Because I'm going to tell you something. And, and I mentioned this during Sunday school. We talked a little bit about predestination. And I hope you kind of got the gist of what I was saying here. But let me tell you something. If God doesn't call out to you, let there be light, you will never, ever be saved. You will never be saved. So you say, well, how is that fair to everybody? Listen, I don't know all the answers. I know what Romans chapter 1 says. Romans chapter 1 says that God has revealed it to all of mankind through the creation. 
Now, you know, we've had the benefit of having the gospel preached to us all our life. Like, like Gary said, he was raised in church. But he walked without the church and without living for God for so many years of his life. But he had the benefit of hearing the gospel long time ago when he was little. May, you heard it when you were five. Lisa, you were young. I was young. We all heard the gospel when we were young. But what about people, they say, who live down in the Amazon? They always make that up. I don't know about them. I just know that God reveals himself to them and they reject it. That's what I know about them. But God says to you, let there be light. And what happens when God speaks? It happens exactly the way he said. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. Watch this. God divided the light from the darkness. And the God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Well, the Bible tells us in John chapter 1, if you want to turn there, in the beginning, well, I like that, how John 1 and Genesis 1 all start out the exact same way. In the beginning. One of them points to the other. This is how verses in the Bible are mated together, according to Isaiah. None shall want her mate. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So what is the light that God turned on into your life. It was the light of the Word of God, the Holy Bible. Somebody say amen to that. Because we're living in a world right now where the Bible is now gone out of... It's leaving the churches. It is leaving the church institutions, the seminaries, the, what they call the Bible colleges. It's leaving the denominations. They're no longer following the Word of God and sticking with the Word of God. But I'm here to tell you that if God saved you by the Word of God, you are saved. Amen. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. See, now that, that connects us with Genesis 1. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Let me ask you a question. Do you make yourself a new creature? Do you renew yourself every day? Are you the one who decides when you're going to come out of that darkness, when you're going to be in the light? You're not the one that decides that. God is the one. God is going to lead your life around and around and around until the day you die. And did you know that once we get to heaven, there's not going to be any more night? No darkness. No days of the week. None of that. God ends the cycles once we get to heaven. Amen. Verse 4. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. So when God said, let there be light, what God was doing with you was He was saying, let there be life. Do you agree with that? You think that that's what it means here in verse 4? In Him was life, and the life was the light of men? Sure it does. Because when God shines a light in your life, He means to give you life, and that you would have it more abundantly. Your Christian walk is far better then your day's doing drugs, your day's drinking, your day's chasing, for going from bed to bed, woman to woman, man to man, or whatever it is. Verse 5, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. That is a direct link to Genesis chapter 1. Who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts. That's what it means when God said, Let there be light. That day... When I was sitting in my office, uh, Melissa, you said something a while ago about the day that you got saved. Uh, God told you to read the Bible and you picked the Bible up and it was a King James Version. Where in the world did you get the idea that that was an evil book? Your mom told you that. Oh, yeah, got to do what your mama says, I guess. Man, oh man. Because I was sitting in my office one day. I was not looking for this. But God spake to my heart and said, Mike, that Bible's right. And you know it is. That was God saying, let there be light. 
I didn't come up with that on my own. I didn't come up with it by myself. I wasn't even looking for that thing. That was God's idea. It was God's work. It was God turning the light on. And I'm here to tell you, if God doesn't turn the light on, you're not going anywhere. It's as simple as that. Uh, to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God um, in the face of Jesus Christ. The face, you know why it mentions the face of Jesus Christ? What did Jesus' face look like in Matthew 17? Mount of Transfiguration. Shining like the sun. What does his face look like? We've been studying Revelation 10. What does his face look like in Revelation 10? Like the sun. Okay. I mean, doesn't, doesn't it all make sense now? Look And look at 2 Corinthians 6.14. You know what God was telling you? You see, in Genesis 1, God said he divided the light from the darkness. God does not mingle the two of them together. You understand that? Do not have a yin-yang symbol on your car, on your book covers, or God forbid, don't tattoo it on your skin. In fact, let me just tell you this. Don't tattoo nothing on your skin. God said, do not print any marks on your skin. If God said that, you ought to do it. Amen. If God says it, why can we think that we can do it anyway? Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That means you don't join clubs with lost people in it. That means you don't, you don't go into business with somebody that's lost. You don't have business partnerships with somebody that's lost. That means you don't marry somebody that's lost. Amen. You don't do that because you're always going to have problems. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness. You say, well, we go, down to, we go down to the union hall and they have a little beer and they have cocktails down there. Now, I don't participate in that. Yeah, but you're there. You're in there. Well, you know, we joined the Knights of Columbus. That's a Catholic organization. We joined the Knights of Columbus and, you know, they, they, have, a little, they have a little beer at, the, at their stuff. Well, we don't do that stuff. God said, don't join them. Don't go in league with them. Don't connect with them. What fellowship do you, who has the righteousness of God on you, what fellowship do you have with things that are dark? With unrighteousness. What communion hath light with darkness? None of them. But that, I was talking about that yin-yang symbol. It means there's a little light in all darkness and a little darkness in all light. But the Bible says God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. That means the light that is shining in your life right now is a pure light from God. And there is no shadows in it. There's no darkness in it whatsoever. Ephesians 5.13 But all things that are reproved and made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. So you know what God's doing? You understand what God's doing when God turns the light on. He's showing you things in your life that are not in accordance with His will, His law, His covenant, His testimony, and His judgments. He's showing you that there are problem areas in your life. That while you might like to have a higher opinion of yourself than what God has of you, God will make you see yourself exactly the way you are in God's sight. Why do you think God told Amos to say this? I have set a plumb line in the midst of my people. What does a plumb bob do? It points straight up and down by use of gravity. Does gravity ever bend a plumb bob? Once it stops swinging, it's pointing straight up and straight down and there isn't anything in the world that can make it do otherwise. And when God sets his plumb line in the midst of his people, you know how his people look? 
skewed, crooked, off. That's how all of us are. So God will shine the light in us to manifest things in us that either A, we didn't know, or B, we knew, but we thought we kept it hidden enough, or things that we knew was in our life, but our pride told us there's nothing really wrong with that. Let me preach on things for a minute. Y'all let me do that. This is where preachers get in the most trouble. I can stand up here for a year and say, sin is bad. Sin is evil. Boy, don't you sin. Get all the sin out of your life. And you, amen, Pastor Mike. Boy, that's good preaching. But if I say this that you're doing is a sin. That might rub your feathers the wrong way. And that's usually when church people get mad at the preacher. When he starts naming things given to him by the Holy Ghost. And he may not know you're doing it. But then again, he may know that you're doing it. And let me say something to you so that we have our, the nature of our, of our fellowship and our communion is laid out plain. It is my responsibility that if I learn something about you, whether you told it to me yourself or someone else told it to me or I saw it happen in your life, it is my responsibility to preach it. Whether it makes you mad or not, whether it hurts your feelings or not, it is my responsibility to say it. And if I don't say it, I've got to give an account to my God on Judgment Day. And I'm already worried about that. I already don't want to go stand before God. Because there's been too many things in all the years that I've preached, too many things that I let go. And it's not right. And the worst thing that you can do for our relationship is to let me know that certain things that I preach make you mad and you don't like them. And trust me, that's happened. Because then I either have to preach it because you said that or I stay away from preaching it and I'm wrong there but you force the issue and one of us is not going to be happy at the end of the day so if God makes things manifest and you know what let me do this I mentioned Tattoos. Now, the word tattoo is not in the Bible, but Leviticus 19. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Now, how am I supposed to preach that? How am I supposed to preach that? Am I supposed to ignore that or gloss over it and say, well, that doesn't really mean that? Or am I supposed to tell you God said, in fact, God, when he, when he gave that commandment, he put his signature on it. I'm the Lord. And let me ask you a question. Is Jesus really the one in charge of you? Is he Lord? Because that's one of the seven spirits of God, according to Isaiah 11, the spirit of the Lord. In fact, that's the first one. And that spirit in you recognizes that if God says this is wrong, then you say that's wrong. You agree with God that God said it and it's in no uncertain terms. You know what it says, you know what it means. And God said, don't do it. 
So am I supposed to say it's okay if it's a little tattoo? Am I supposed to say that? Am I supposed to say, well, if you put it where nobody can see it, it's okay. I don't, there's nothing, there's nothing here that tells me what circumstances it is okay. There's just what he said, and then he said, I'm the Lord. He said, don't print any marks on you. Don't do it. So as your pastor, it's my responsibility to say to you, don't do it. Well, let's pick up another one. How about, how about wine, beer, liquor? See any place in the Bible? Where it says, oh, it's okay to have a little snort every now and then. God said, do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee. That's just one, that's just one verse. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So, seeing that, is it okay for you then to have a little bottle of wine laying around the house or a case of beer out in the garage fridge? Is it okay for you to do that? Is it okay for you to, when you come home at the end of the day, for you to take a drink or two or three because it calms your nerves, helps you go to sleep at night? Is, is that, can I, is, am I supposed to go to that level and tell you that it is okay, that God didn't really mean all that. After all, Jesus made wine. That's what I hear. Jesus made wine. And you want me to believe that our Savior and Lord, who was the high priest over all, wanted everybody to get drunk at that, the first, the first miracle that he did, is you want me to believe, you want me to teach, that Jesus got everybody snotting out drunk, at this wedding feast. He didn't. He made new wine. New wine comes from the cluster. It's not been corrupted with leaven. That's how you make it, isn't it? You add leaven to your grape juice. You add leaven to your barley. You add leaven to your corn. And the leaven eats all the sugar out of it, takes all the sweetness out of it, and, re and belches out alcohol. And makes you do stupid things. And it, according to the scriptures, it, where is it? Wine is a mocker, so where is that? Where it calls you, it makes you uh, say perverse things and look at strange women. Makes you sing dirty songs, tell dirty jokes, makes you look at women, makes you look at men. And you're out of your mind and you're wanting everybody to believe you're a Christian. You, want, you wonder why your kids are going bad. I'm here to tell you it's not okay. It's not okay. And those are the things and the issues that as pastor, it's my responsibility to preach them every now and then. Or to teach them to you and do it in love. Because I do love you. I do care about you. I care about this church. I care about my testimony and how I'm seen among people. And when I go wrong, I have to deal with it as well. I have to preach against my own sins. That's what shining the light, 
does. It shines a light in you and it manifests things that you say it's not a big deal. I can do this. It's okay. But if the word of God says no, you can't do it. You can't do it. All things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. And that's, that points directly to your life, Gary, the day before you got saved. You were dead in trespasses and sins. And just like with Lazarus, it was the spoken word of God that made Lazarus come alive. Jesus did spoke three words. Lazarus come forth and boom, here he comes. He's alive again after being dead four days. And the corruption of four days is bad. But now he's alive. So awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Ye are, in fact, turn there in your Bible. Turn to 1 Peter, please. I may be wrong. I may be wrong. But I, I sort of get the feeling that there is a, a spirit of opposition here this morning. I may be wrong. I've been wrong before. And I will be wrong again. I, I don't know who it would be coming from, where it would be coming from. But I want you to know that I care about you. I care about you. I care about your family. I care about your well-being, your life. I know the things that God has brought me out of and the things that God has yet still to bring me out of. And I'm here to tell you, if, if I come off this morning seeming like I'm trying to act better than you, I'm telling you I'm not. Ask me. And I'll tell you some things. Ask my wife. She'll tell you more. But I've struggled with lots of things. I've had to have people come to me and tell me, you're not right. That's hard to take. But it's had to happen. They were just following the Bible. And I don't want anyone in this church to be opposed if I'm preaching straight out of the book. The book is why we're all gathered here. The book is is what makes everything between you and I even and level, doesn't it? Because I'm not preaching what I think you ought to be doing. I'm teaching you and preaching to you what God said you ought to be doing and what God, what God said you ought not be doing. So I think there is an agreement here that the Bible is what binds us together. If you choose to separate yourself from parts of the Word of God, it's either all, you're either all in or all out with God. It's not part way. There is no halfway, straddle the fence, serving God. You don't come here on Sunday, serve God, and then six days later, not be serving God. You serve God. 
I'm not saying for you to be perfect. That's not possible. Only Jesus is perfect. Only the inner man in us is without sin. The outer flesh of us is full of sin. And it needs to be cut off. It needs to be what God does with the, the fruitful vine. He'll cut off branches out of our life that are unfruitful. He'll take away things out of us that are no good. He'll convince us that we're wrong in certain areas. And he'll show us what's right. And Christ being in us will lead us to righteousness. First Peter chapter 2. There's a reason why he says this. Um, verse 5. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Do you know that first verse that I read to you about wine and strong drink and not do it was to the priesthood? And I've had some people say, well, that was to the priesthood. That's not for us. Excuse me. We're the priesthood. Do you not get that? If God said it to the Levites, surely it would apply to us as well as being a royal priesthood. Priesthood to offer up spirit. I've had, listen, I've got 30 some odd years of people trying to dodge the Bible. Okay? And I've learned, I've heard some pretty flimsy excuses. One guy in the church I was at down in Richwoods said, well, you know, I, the Bible teaches that you can do anything as long as it's in moderation. Is there a moderate adulterer? There is not a moderate drinker. It's all in or all out. He says, you're a holy priesthood. Verse 6, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. The chief cornerstone is the part of your life that keeps you straight and true. It's not the capstone. It's not on top. It's on the corner. That, that true stone, the way the, the stonemasons call it, they have to make that stone exactly 90 degrees because the rest of the walls that are built around it are going to follow that, that same line. And if that stone is off, then the house is going to be crooked. It won't be stable and it will fall. Do you understand that? You cannot build a crooked house and expect it to last. It will not work. I did not plan on preaching this. But in verse 7, he said, Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. So the things that are in the word of God that are telling you how to live, they should be precious to you. And you should say, I don't want to lose the word of God out of my life. I do not want God to give up on me, to stop telling me things. That's how you ought to be. And you which therefore believe he is precious, but unto them, watch this now, but to them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. So you know what this, you know what I'm saying to you this morning? And I'm talking to all the people online, and all the people who's going to listen to it afterward. If I've rubbed you the wrong way this morning, if I said something that, makes you mad or that puts you in opposition to me, if I've done that this morning, the problem is not what I said. The problem lies with you and your disobedience. And when you are disobedient, the same cornerstone that is meant to keep your life true and straight, you will disallow. You're no better than the NIV committee who decided the word sodomite was not the right word to put in the Old Testament. They, had, they substituted uh, shrine temple prostitutes. But they did not want the word sodomite 
being a bad sin in the Old Testament because there was a lesbian on the translating committee. Did you know that? An avowed butch lesbian on the committee. And so you know what? They disallowed parts of the Bible that they didn't like. And now it's worse. Now they've gender neutralized the NIV. Which means that they've disallowed whole doctrines. Right out of the scriptures. The same stone that was elect and precious to them that believe. Has been disallowed. So I'm going to go back to the. Tattoo thing. Can you disallow that part of the scriptures? I won't even finish the statement. Can you disallow that part of the scriptures? No. If you do, you're just as guilty as the sodomites, as the gender fluid movement is. You're just as guilty. If I, as your pastor, disallow things from the Bible that might get me in trouble, then I'm just as guilty as everybody else is who don't like things in the Bible and they just take them out at will. So, verse 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then in 2 Peter 1, 19, you, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Until the day dawn and the day star rise in your heart. So you're either going to be one of two people this morning. You're either going to be the person when God shines the light in, you accept the light for what it is. And you receive that light and you say, I want this. The way some of you testified today, you just knew God was calling you to salvation and you said, I want this. Or... You'll be like what John said in John chapter 1. The light shined in darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not. And you said, well, I don't want that. That's not for me. And that does it, probably doesn't really mean what it says in the original Hebrew. So I don't, I don't, that's, that's under the law. We don't have to do that. You're either going to be one of two people. So I'm going to pray this morning. And if you want to come down to any one of these benches down here, you're more than welcome. I'm going to open that up for you this morning. And I'm going to say to you this morning, if I'm wrong about there being an oppositional spirit here, uh, then God will correct me for that. But if there is an opposing force in this place, I'm going to pray that God will remove it. And if He does, be ready for your life to be changed.